to Paul giving us the second half of his tutorial on qubit uncertainty. Thank you. Just as a quick recap, yesterday I explored the question why it took so long to <coughs> consider measurement uncertainty seriously. And um, we ended up describing the challenges ahead in doing so. Um, this is the scheme that I'm going to fulfill today. It's the task of finding compatible approximators, C and D, for target observables A and B that are incompatible. Compatibility being the constraint that guarantees that there is a joint observable for C and D, so that one can get a joint approximation in one uh, measurement scheme single measurement scheme and measure position, say, and momentum to good, whatever good degree of approximation. So we need a way of formulating the constraint of compatibility, and we need suitable measures of approximation errors. So that's the task in this game. And I also showed you with those two pictures, I don't go into them uh, anymore now, how to reduce measure, measurements of disturbance, measures of disturbance, to measures of uh, approximation error and joint measurements. So that relieves us of the task of considering joint measurement uncertainty relations and error disturbance relations separately. If we do one, we have the other as well. So, as a warm-up, I'll go through the theme of preparation uncertainty. The thought behind that is that we found in several examples that in the end, once you've formalized, all is done and dusted, uh, you realize that underlying measurement uncertainty, after all, is preparation uncertainty. And this is sort of fulfilling a dictum that goes back to Niels Bohr, who said um, the measurement, the possibilities of definition cannot, ex uh, the possibilities of measurement cannot exceed the possibilities of definition. I would translate that as saying whatever limitations we have on defining, on preparing variables, um, we can't beat that by measuring them. So preparation uncertainty relations. There is the first question, why on earth do we stick with multiplicative relations, delta x, delta y, greater or equal the commutator expectation. Why on earth do we do that? Well, the answer is we don't have to. And it's often not the ideal thing to do. So let's play with this here for position and momentum, and then go discrete. So x naught is an arbitrary positive parameter. Then this inequality is tight. It's the square of the, uh, the variance of position plus the variance of momentum, greater or equal to constant, modulo those scale factors. And I claim that's proven easily by taking the ground state of the harmonic oscillator because this here is a, the expectation of a form of scaled and translated harmonic oscillator amortization. So that would be a way of proving this uncertainty relation, which is additive rather than multiplicative. And curiously, it is exactly as strong as the multiplicative form in this case. So here's, and, and incidentally, you can also take the standard deviations instead and take the SM and have a bound, and that is again equivalent. So here's a quick run of the proof. Take this simple algebraic inequality here. <coughs> and use it to prove this equivalence. Delta Q delta P greater or equal to H bar over 2. Well, that implies, doing this trick here, that implies, using the bound here, that this quantity has the bound 2H bar squared. So that's one direction. How do we get back? How do we, from assuming this, how do we get this? Well, you just observe that this whole both sides uh, hold equally well if I make a rescaling of position and hence momentum. If I scale position by lambda, then momentum gets scaled by 1 over lambda. 
and that doesn't change this term. It brings in a factor lambda here and one over lambda there, and then you can choose your lambda so that the bracket gets zero and you get back to this. Right? Okay, so that's um, showing that there are cases in quantum mechanics where multiplicative uncertainty relations are equivalent to additive ones. Um, we got used to this one because it goes neatly with the <coughs> Cauchy Schwartz inequality, Hilbert space. We could have gone here um, and got it out of there uh, using properties of the harmonic oscillator of Hamiltonian, especially its ground state energy. Anyway, that's just, well, it's not just a play, because if we do look for measurement uncertainty relations for position momentum, then that is a decisive observation to minimize whatever error measures we came up with. The suitable error measures, this is the suitable, the, the, the right thing to look at. Um, ground state energy of the harmonic oscillator, that immediately gives rise to bounds for a certain type of error measures. So that's not the theme of my talk here, but the basic idea is that in this way, it turns out that preparation uncertainty and uh, measurement uncertainty are very closely linked in the case of position and momentum. I'm not going to do position and momentum for you here, um, but focus on qubits. So there's first of all this important observation for bounded observables, the standard uncertainty relation in terms of the products of variances or standard deviations isn't very strong. It's not at all a straight, but a tight constraint. The lower bound vanishes from near eigenstates, as we know, and so we have no real limit for delta A, delta B, no real positive limit. So let's look at qubits. This should be known to all of us here. We take the Pauli matrices that have had an appearance many times already. States parameterized here in, in block sphere notation with vectors r whose length are at most one. Operators generally have this form. Effects in particular um, will have to have eigenvalues between zero and one. And for, this, for the purpose of this talk, I take observables of interest to have just values plus minus one. Well, uncertainty considerations shouldn't particularly depend on the choice of the values of the observables. And so we could as well choose them conveniently, and that is what I do here. So the observables of interest are our target observables, sharp observables A and B, so plus minus one associated with projections, which is ensured by having the log vectors length one. C and D are our intended approximators. And, um, well, I write them here with these parameters gamma and delta in front of the identity and log vectors C and D and the positivity constraint for C plus and C minus is guaranteed by this requirement. So these objects will be used. Here are some special cases. We call an observable symmetric or also unbiased if gamma is zero and sharp if gamma is zero and the vector is length one. And that suggests the definition of unsharpness to be u of c, well, the square, equal to 1 minus the length of c squared. So this quantity gets to 0 if c is projection valued and gets to maximum 1 if c is a trivial observable, maximally unsharp. So that's a convenient measure to use later on. I say unbiased, there's a bit of an ambiguity because that's a second use of the term unbiased. I've spoken about unbiased approximations being those where the first moment of the approximator distribution is the same as the first moment of the target distribution. Here, unbiasedness refers to the fact that C plus and C minus do not favor the yes or no outcome uh, on taking the uh, trivial state one half the identity, which is completely neutral to plus or minus outcomes 
or should be. So C plus minus giving the same probabilities for that state requires gamma to be zero. So there is otherwise there would be biasness toward for C plus towards a yes answer or a no answer depending on the value of gamma. So that's a different sense of biasness. <coughs> So preparation uncertainty for qubit observables, let's start simple, again, finger exercise that you might take away as a nice exercise for your quantum mechanics 1 students. So we take sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, a state rho, so the expectations of sigma k are rho rk, the components, k component of the r vector, and here it's Schrodinger's uncertainty relation in full beauty. Product of variances for sigma 1 and sigma 2 is greater or equal, yeah, the commutator term squared plus the covariance term squared. That translates into, well, here the variance, and again, the product of variances, and then you work out these terms, and that is what you get, and play with this, and you see this is just saying that R1 squared plus R2 squared plus R3 squared is not greater than 1. So that's just equivalent to the equivalent to the positivity of the state vector, the state operator. And in fact, this can be rewritten. Uh, add a 2 on both sides, then rearrange, and you have this. You have a triple uncertainty relation which is additive. So the variance of sigma sigma 1 plus the variance of sigma 2 plus the variance of sigma 3 all add up to at least 2. That's a tight relation and it's certainly stronger than um, only con uh, considering two variances, variances. But this again is more informative already than the multiplicative uncertainty relation. Because here you do have a non-trivial bound. So that's uh, dead easy and um, nevertheless quite cute. Now let's generalize this. We take two arbitrary, say, spin directions, and yeah, we could play with this. Why don't we take the sum of the variances, and if you work it out, you find the tight bound is this, 1 minus the modulus of a dot b, and you can rewrite that. Well, this is a geometric statement. Now, freeing ourselves of Bloch's fair language at this point would lead us to bringing the a cross b in here, and that relates to the norm of the commutator of a and b. So, the sum of the variances is bounded below by a function that is monotonic in the, in the non-commutativity can work out where this is, where the equality is reached by observing that this works optimally if we go to pure states and then you find the tight bound is actually attained here and the vector A plus B normalized. Or you could take the sum of the standard deviations and minimize that. Again, you find the tight bound attained at a different set of points. Well, which of those is better or worse? Can we do better? And the real question really is to determine the full uncertainty region, which is the region of points with coordinates delta A, delta B, such that delta A is delta rho A. This is really a standard deviation. Delta B is a standard deviation in the same state. And um, particularly, want to we want to find a lower bound curve for that region. So. Given the constraint, say we fix delta A to be delta rho A, we want to find the rho star so that delta rho star B is the minimum of all those delta Bs uh, with some suitable state rho prime for which the delta A is the same as the original one. And again, as I pointed out, the standard uncertainty relation is of no use to answer that. So why ever did we stop there? Solution is in this case, with the choice of values of the observables being plus minus one, uh, particularly simple. You can look at this diagram. 
you know, log vectors A and B for sharp target observables, of which we take the want to optimize the variances simultaneously. Um, take any vector R, state vector R. Here I've indicated it as a choice of a unit vector, but all the vectors on this circle here, circular polar cut, have the same value of, of R cross A. Uh, similarly for R cross B. And um, then we have this simple relation here that the angles just add up for arc sine A cross B equal to arc sine R cross A plus arc sine R cross B if we choose R in the plane spanned by A and B and between A and B. Right? That's just trivial observation. Now also observing that the variances or standard deviations are bounded by those of a corresponding unit vector, we then can plug that into this equation and we get the inequality which says then here really the arc sine of alpha, cosine of beta and likewise here and that sum of terms is greater or equal to the term A cross B norm and that is the norm of the commutator of A and B. So that's the ultimate Preparation uncertainty relation, which for any choice of delta rho A gives you the associated delta rho B, so that this inequality holds. And we know where to look for equality sign for each realization of delta rho A. So that's the optimized. Um, Cubic uncertainty, preparation uncertainty relation for two variables A and B. Okay, let's move on. Ah, here's an illustration and the answer to the question. So the straight line is the sum of standard deviations. In the case where A dot B has value 1 over root 2, there's a straight line for this inequality as the boundary. There is a circular line for x squared plus <coughs> y squared and each of those coincides with the optimized curve which is the green one here at their optimal points. Now you see that the actual values in general for the bounds are given as a cross b or 1 minus modulus of a dot b or again a cross b modulus. And if you sort of play with this, I should have made an animation here. If you drive this to maximum incompatibility where A and B are orthogonal, you get a 1 here, you get a full circle of radius 1 here, and the green one also becomes a full circle of radius 1. So in that limit case, um, this equation becomes the same as that. And you could go to A and B being more and more compatible, then the opposite happens. And these lines shrink down here, and the green one becomes approximately equal to the blue line. So you can play with that and um, start to see. So the allowed regions, I should have indicated these are then all the points up here above that green line. These can all be realized by some state as the uh, values of delta A and delta B in that state. So, it would be nice if anyone could go ahead and do this <coughs> numerically, given observable A and B in any Hilbert space, uh, find that diagram in these curves. So there is a little research problem. Now, moving on to the task solving the task of finding optimal joint approximate measurements of two incompatible quantities A and B. So first I have to talk about the compatibility of two observables which I need as the approximators. I'll have to watch the time. I was planning to give you all the proofs in detail because I'd like to convince you that after all nowadays it's a matter of maybe two to three hours 
lecture time in a course on quantum mechanics or foundations of quantum mechanics for undergraduates that you could easily teach all this stuff, at least for qubits. You can do it from scratch, piece by piece, and give all the proofs in an elementary way. So maybe I can be quick with this, um, just to give you an idea of what's involved. So, I introduced the symmetric case, which is effects of this form, <coughs> half the identity plus minus c dot sigma, and it turns out, as you will see, this is sufficient for optimal compatible approximations. And for that case, it's particularly easy to prove this proposition here, which gives a necessary and sufficient condition for the compatibility of these two observables. And that condition is that the block vectors have to satisfy this, equation, this inequality here. Length of C plus D plus the length of C minus D is at most 2. So that's again a plain geometric statement, but it has a nice interpretation. Bringing in the unsharpness, 1 minus C squared, and remembering that C cross D, the norm, is twice the norm of the commutator of C plus and D plus, the operators. So then we can rewrite this here with some manipulation into, it, it involves repeated squaring here of these terms, so to eliminate all these norm terms and replace them by squared norm terms, and keeping track that you are really doing equivalent transformations, that gives you this form of inequality. The unsharpness of C squared times the unsharpness of D squared is bounded below by 4 times the square of the norm of the commutator of C plus and D plus. Now, so that's the statement. This is equivalent to the compatibility of C and D here. This is in fact an entirely new uncertainty relation, if you like, that Heisenberg didn't envisage. It concerns, in this case, the necessary and sufficient condition for two observables that do not commute to nevertheless be jointly measurable. And the price that you pay for joint measurability here, as you see, is a sufficient amount of unsharpness of both of them. So that's what I would call an unsharpness relation, if anything. Um, that's the price to pay for, not for joint measurability. Yeah? maximum expectation value of the or modulus of the expectation value. Sorry. So if they don't commute, that just means what the definition is then of being compatible or jointly measurable. Is it that compatibility, joint measurability is the other word, so it means there is a joint observable for these. That gives the margin also. Yeah. So I'll tie up with that in a moment. So let's see what well, this is the example I promised yesterday. Yesterday I showed you this trivial way of mixing C and D with some trivial observables and thereby achieving joint measurability. And the mixing parameters, the mixing weights in front of C and D had to be adding up to one. So if lambda was a half, then mu had to be a half, and that would do it. Here I'm saying that Ah, that's a typo, C squared plus D squared, less or equal 1. So if we take C and D orthogonal, ah, if C and D are orthogonal, then this bound becomes 1, and this resolves into C squared plus D squared, less or equal 1, very easily. So compatibility is equivalent to that, and or equivalent to, yeah, likewise, the some of the unsharpness is greater or equal to 1. So, pick lambda to be the length of C and D, so we take that case where C and D have the same length. Then we see that C plus minus and D plus minus, there are really smearings as we had it, or mixings of the original, of an original sharp C observable and the D observable with some trivial observable. And here we find compatibility is given if and only if 
lambda is not greater than 1 over root 2. And 1 over root 2 is a possibility. So we don't have to go down, have to go down all the way to a half. We can be more efficient. Incidentally, that is the starting point for developing a theory of uh, incompatibilities. You can take that as a measure of the incompatibility of two observables, and then you can ask, let's say for two valued observables in Hilbert space, how um, bad can it get? And in two dimensions, this is at, as bad as it gets, um, lambda being uh, 1 over root 2 is, is the worst we have to accept. If we take the square bit state space, we can play this game and ask for the amount of incompatibility. We find that lambda has to be no greater than one half if we want to allow compatibilities for all observables. So there are observable pairs of observables that are much more incompatible than we find in two dimensional Hilbert spaces. Just as a side remark, uh, that, that game can be played and we can look at how much incompatibility there is in any given probabilistic theory. <coughs> so, yeah, what is involved in the proof? I'll start slightly more generally here. So C0 not necessarily 1 at the beginning, but I'll be, I will be switching to that shortly again. <coughs> so we are asking for a characterization of when these two, are, these two observables are compatible or jointly measurable, do admit a joint observable. And here's the condition scaled out. So this is the case by definition. If there is a, an observable, say with these four effects, so that C is a marginal by summing over the second label, D is a marginal of the marginal by obtained by summing over the first label. Now, in our context here, that means that is the case if and only if there is a positive operator, and that is to be our G here, G++ plus plus is, to be, is now called G. We parameterize it in, in a standard way and um, well this expresses the marginality of the g plus plus is called g then g plus minus added to this should give us c plus g minus plus added to g plus plus should give us the d plus and then if you take this all together you find g minus minus has to be the complement and it's this term so these are all operators we will be looking at. They, the requirement is they have to be positive. And once they are, once we guarantee they are positive, then you see they add up to the identity and they satisfy the marginality. So we have to be concerned now with fulfilling positivity of all four of them. So C and D are compatible if and only if there is a G such that is that form, and it's here summarized what we have again, so we see it, and that is the case if and only if there exist these parameters, g0 and vector g, such that the vector g has length at most g0, then we look at the effect c, minus, c plus minus g, and that positivity of that means that the vector c minus g has length at most c0 minus g0, and so on for d plus minus g, and for the last effect that I wrote here. And that gives us this condition. Now, you can look at that geometrically. That is telling us that G has to lie in the intersection of four balls. Centered at, one centered at the origin, one centered at endpoint of vector C, endpoint of vector D, and endpoint of vector C plus D. So that's the picture that is emerging. And then you think you could solve that quickly, and uh, I have to admit I haven't been able. Um, when I looked at this first, I just did it then for the case of C naught, D naught being one, the symmetric case. 
in which case it then becomes all very simple. The general case had to wait for a number of years and in 2009 um, there were three groups presenting a full solution almost simultaneously, so there was almost a competition going on in uh, generalizing this result. And I'm not going into that because it is a rather long-winded story. One way of solving this compatibility problem for qubits actually turned out to be, well, our way of doing it turned out to be an exercise in Minkowski geometry quite nicely. Of course, you know, perhaps there's a nice morphism between the Bloch sphere, vector space, um, extended by the zeroth dimension and Minkowski space. So that's an intriguing little phenomenon to know about. In any case, um, this reduces further, we have only to be concerned about the existence of G0, so that, yeah, as I said, the intersection of these four balls is not empty. So we can be sure there is a G to be chosen in, in line all four of these balls. Now, here's the case C0, D0 being 1, and that is the picture where if you take your time, you see the balls around this origin, C, vector D, and vector C plus D. And interestingly, the, opposite, the, the diagonally opposite balls, they have related radii, 1 minus G, 1 minus G here, these opposite ones, and these have uh, G naught and G naught. So, in order for these four to have non-empty intersections, you see that the radii have to exceed half the distances of these op opposite points. And that is a simple condition to write out. Opposite, diagonally opposite balls must intersect, that is a minimal condition. So that tells you that C plus D length is less or equal, and here is again the full expression for these sums of radii and C minus D distance has its upper bound here, <coughs> the sums of those radii. And in the case of C0 and D0 being 1, this becomes very simple, and in general, of course, as a necessary, con necessary condition, you have this here. Add these two sides and add these two sides, and that is what you get. So that's a necessary condition, and we've seen how that can be translated into an unsharpness requirement. Is it sufficient? Well, it is in that symmetric case. And um, we see that by doing some algebra again to confirm this condition is in fact equivalent to these inequalities. And that, yeah, he didn't distinguish the stars here because this is literally the same upon rearrangement for that. And that can be used in the special case of symmetric observables, C0 and D0-1. We can then just constructively go ahead, given our compatibility condition, that necessary condition that I showed you, we then can choose G0 to have this value here, which appeared here, half of that value. And that does the trick. Then G can be chosen to be a half C plus D, it's the midpoint where the diagonals intersect in that parallelogram that I showed you. And then we can define a particular joint observable of this form. And the positivity is simply equivalent to that um, compatibility condition. So this allows us for this special case to immediately go backwards, showing that this condition this condition here is in fact also sufficient, not only necessary, but also sufficient. Just by constructing a joint that does the job. So that's, if you follow through in your own time, you'll see there's nothing deep in that. And that's the compatibility theorem proven. Now, we're ready to go to proximate joint measurements. Um, Today I'll do this with the probabilistic distance and tomorrow I give you a variety of alternative distance measures with which one could do a similar 
analysis. Um, so the idea, as I said earlier, is C is a good approximation to observable A if the probability distributions are similar for all states. And um, I want to quantify that with some choice of metric, first on probability distributions and then on observables. But you could think of other measures of error. And I'll have a bit more to say about that tomorrow. So here is, well, all in one. I should have stopped, forget about this sub over row here. Then what we have is the worst case difference of the probabilities of C and A over all possible outcomes, sup supremum over all outcome sets X. And then we take the supremum over rho, or do it the other way round, and you find this is all equal to the supremum over <coughs> x of the norm of c of x minus a of x effects. So at this stage, without the sup over rho, this is essentially something like the total variation norm of probability measures. And then we go on to turn that into a distance of observables by taking the worst case distance of probability distributions across all states. So, in the qubit case this becomes essentially equal to what we know as the one norm among the set of LP norms, for those who know what that means. If there was a square here everywhere then we would have the usual, well, usual Euclidean norm, if you like, the L2 norm. But this is what comes out here using that definition. So bear that in mind. This is in four dimensions, up to a factor of a half. This is really like a kind of one there. Now, I'll say a bit about yeah, comparing this with Ozawa's approach. Yeah, I use the word measurement noise. Um, that seems to be a more neutral term to measurement error. Ozawa would call this an error. Uh, the definition comes from quantum optics, the theory of um, amplification and noise operators. And that is carried over into quantum measurement by Ozawa as a suggested error of a measure of error. So what have we got here? So the standard notation for it is epsilon <coughs> epsilon of CA in a state phi, could also be the state rho more generally. <coughs> and for short, I use this notation epsilon A, epsilon sub A squared for all this. So the original definition is take a measurement of A or an approximate, some measurement scheme that is purported to approximate A, approximately determine A. There is a pointer observable that evolves in time, and then we compare it to A, take the squared difference, and the expectation thereof. Sounds suggestive enough. Looks like a root mean square error if we take the root of this. Uh, you can work on this to bring it down to the language of the little bit space of the object alone. Rho here is then the state operator, project onto phi. And this notation should have called it sub phi. So the expectation of the second moment operator of C minus the square of the first moment operator plus the difference of the first moment operators of C and A observables squared and the expectation thereof. Now, I'll have to say a lot more about this in my talk tomorrow. Here I point only to some oddities with this concept. One is immediately visible if you take the qubit case in the symmetric case where C0 was 1, A is a sharp observable, then epsilon A squared just boils down to this term here being 1 minus the length of C squared and that term just giving us the distance squared as one would hope. So that is actually something like our squared probabilistic distance up to a factor of 4, but plus the unsharpness of C again. So it's really a mixed bag. It's partly a distance, 
but then it counts in a contribution from the unsharpness of C on top of that. And that in itself makes it a suspicious quantity to call an error. So we have to be careful with that and cautious and not buy into it too quickly. So that's my first warning here. Epsilon double counts contributions from the unsharpness of the approximator C. And as I said, more on this tomorrow. So now let's use that in, well, let's use the probabilistic error measure, probabilistic distance, to formulate some measurements. <coughs> so the scheme was this, to remind you. We're now able to quantify the quality of the approximations in this joint measurement scheme, which should lead to compatible observables approximating A and B. The goal is to have these distances between C and A and D and B simultaneously as small as possible, subject to the constraint that C and D are compatible. So again, the game is, in that space of points, coordinates of which are these approximation errors for A and for B, DA and DB, in that space, to find the sort of lower boundary curve so that for any given distance, say for A, DA, you want to find the smallest possible distance for the B measurement. Smallest possible error for the B measurement. And that would be the analog to the uncertainty game that I presented earlier. Here for approximation errors. So here's a picture that illustrates that. This blue shaded area is the allowed region where each point has coordinates. Well, here I stupidly call this dB and that dA. So the points are dB, dA coordinates. And you can figure out very fairly easily that if one error is zero, the other one has to be maximally large at sine theta over two, where theta, theta is the angle between A and B. And what I'm concerned with them now is characterizing this straight line here that touches the curve here. And that would give us a decent, simple form of uh, error trade-off relation. So that's the task. Let's do some provisional considerations. So I'm fixing attention here to just this square from zero to a half on both coordinate axes. Um, if you look at the definition of the probabilistic distance, it ranges between zero and one. So why am I throwing away the rest of this diagram? It should go to one by one, four times as large. Well, the answer is that all these upper areas around here can be trivially realized, of course, observing that if you take trivial approximations, C plus being say gamma times the identity, d plus delta the identity, take one of those, then you find the distance, the, the error, the probabilistic distance of C from A is the max of gamma or un, one minus gamma, and that is no less than a half. So trivial approximations for one uh, <coughs> fills up the region above a half with um, filling points in the horizontal direction with with any approximation that gives the, the required value. So that's easy enough to fill and that's of no concern. We want to really identify the lower boundary curve, the optimal approximation. So there are three steps to go through to find that red straight boundary line that touches the actual boundary curve. So one is to go from a generic situation, the approximators of this generic form, not necessarily symmetric, to a symmetric case. And the argument is that that does not degrade the accuracy. Suppose you have a pair C, plus D, uh, C and D compatible with some values of the errors, the distances from A and B, then the claim is you can symmetrize, you can find new observable C and D that are of the symmetric form, with gamma being zero, 
and still the errors are not greater than you have them already. So that's the task first, to simplify the game, because then we have a handle on compatibility in a very simple way. So here's a bit of Hilbert Space Mass. There's a nice anti-unitary map that has the effect on the sigmas to change their signs. It's again, a nice little exercise to show that this has to be an anti-unitary that does this. But it does exist. I'm going to show you what. But yeah, let's take that and turn the C into C prime, the D into D prime likewise by applying this T. And note, I have to sort of also swap the outcomes, plus minus D minus plus, to make work what I want to show. Then, if C and D are compatible with the joint observable G, then C prime and D prime are compatible with the joint observable G prime, which is treated in the same way. So I showed you a result yesterday that guarantees that this works. So then I had another result which says that I can then mix C and C prime and D and D prime with the same mixing weights and you get C tilde and D tilde still be, being compatible. And those now are by construction symmetric. We have removed the gamma, we have put the gamma equal to zero and the beauty of it is you can, est you can compare the distances of the old C and D uh, and the new C tilde and D tilde and then writing them out you see we have improved the situation, we have improved the approximation so that's a step in the right direction second step is we haven't said anything about the direction of C in relation to A and B and it's a great simplification to go into the plane spanned by A and B and that can be done again by a convexity argument if you have C, say, sticking out of that plane take its mirror Im image on the plane and you get C dash that still has the same distance from A I think that is clear and so you can take a mixture with uh, of the two with equal weights and you get C tilde in the plane spanned by A and B and then by convexity again the distance use the triangle inequality of the new observable is again not greater than the previous distances than the, the average of the previous distances and because they are equal that is the previous distance so that's again a potential improvement go into the plane, choose your approximator in the plane spanned by A and B, by the A and B vectors. So that's um, generic to all steps, in that, to all optimization questions concerning the probabilistic metric here. Now I'm specifying to the function that I'm looking at. The sum of the errors is what I want to minimize. And the, the claim is that this happens in a symmetric constellation. So take any A and B now in the plane spanned by A and B. Take C in approximator to A, D, D to B. They may lie in this asymmetric way relative to A and B. Then, now, what am I doing? I define C dash to be the mirror image of D on that vertical and D dash the mirror image of C on that vertical. So that ensures the right relations for the distances. Um, and then I mix C and C prime into C tilde, D and D prime into D tilde. And that is then these two vectors being as symmetric against the vertical as I chose A and B to be. So A and B are related with some acute angles A and you turn the diagram here so that the midline between them is vertical. So they are symmetric relative to that vertical line. And then what I'm saying is 
for a given C and D, you can find these symmetrized C tilde and D tilde. And again, the approximation, the sum of the approximation errors now hasn't increased, possibly decreased. So here's the mass that goes with this is sum of the approximation errors for the new variable C tilde D tilde. Um, again, using a triangle inequality gives us um, an upper bound by the sums of this mixture for C and C prime and the mixture for D and D prime. And then using the geometry that tells us that the C prime A term is the same as the D B distance, the C A distance is the same as the D prime B distance. And so this all boils down to having the sum of the distances of C from A and D from B. And that is what we need as an upper bound. So we have improved the sum of the errors again. So then the last step really is to see, figure out where the optimal distance is. Well, we have to remember we have a compatibility constraint. Well, in that symmetrized configuration, that means that, yeah, this is the constraint, and that is equivalent to saying that here, the x-coordinate of C and the y-coordinate of C and D add or subtract into plus or minus 1. And so that gives us as constraint lines these diagonal lines here. So if we want to get as close as possible with C to A, we would make sure that the endpoint of C is on that diagonal line, and likewise the endpoint of D is symmetrically placed on that diagonal line. Just comes out as that. Now here we have used the compatibility constraint. Now then we can ask, of course, it's, it's jumping at you now. The shortest distance then of of a point on this diagonal line to A is the one where this red line here hits perpendicular onto this diagonal line. So that's a 45 degree angle against the vertical, and likewise here. And that's the answer. This is the optimal constellation. So that's the full solution. And if you look at the relationships here, then magically you get to work out the optimal sum of distances. A, C, C, A, D, B. Um, those are the expressions. So that's R C minus A. Well, yeah, C minus A, the length, C, B, B minus B is, is the same length, in fact. Uh, if you look at that, well, that length is root 2 times this length, or also root 2 times that length. And that gives you immediately these expressions here, A minus B length minus C minus D length. And likewise here, A plus B length minus C plus D length, all by a factor of a half. And if you plug that in, then this is what you get. Or then remembering that C plus D length plus C minus D length is 2, that brings you down to this. And this is the result. So um, let's put the pictures together here. This is the full solution for this functional that is the sum of the errors that's optimally bounded at this value where the constraint is the compatibility of C and D given by this inequality which is a statement about the unsharpness of C and D and the lower bound here has a term that looks pretty much like this so we see immediately here that is a measure of the incompatibility of A and B as much as this is a measure of the compatibility of C and D as long as this sum of terms is less than or equal to 2, we have compatibility. If we were to go greater than 2, which we are doing here, then we have incompatibility. So that is an incompatibility witness, if you like. And of course, you see that by working out what this is. Geometrically, this relates to A cross B norm. And again, then, monotonic function of the commutator of the projectors A plus and B plus. So that's um, 
one form of measurement on certain relations for qubits. It would be nice, and it has been done in the meantime, only just last year, to characterize this full boundary curve analytically. Um, this involves analyzing this picture here in, here in detail. Let me just briefly talk you through that. It's quite neat, actually. Yeah, your target, sharp target observer, this block unit vectors A and B. We have some approximators C and D. And in the optimal constellation, in this general case, where A and B are not necessarily orthogonal, what you have to have is C and D, as long as they can be given the compatibility constraint. Now, the compatibility constraint, if you think about it briefly, Well, let's go to the limit then, equal to 2. If you fix one of the vectors, say C, that constraint gives you, well, is the equation of an ellipse with C in the semi major axis. And that fixes a set of points D, the endpoints of the vector D, that are allowed by compatibility. And those ellipses are given here. <coughs> C is on the line of a semi-major axis of the red ellipse. You see it hits this, the, the great circle here, the unit circle there, and there, that axis. And that's the red ellipse, which is the, the set of allowed points, given compatibility, of D. So fix C, then D is constrained in this way to lie inside the endpoint to lie in that inside that ellipse. And of course you go to the border to come as close as possible to B. So really what we need is both, and similarly this applies to C, if D is fixed, then C has to be on the border. And at the same time, of course, we can draw circles around A and B, which in the optimal case will tangentially hit those ellipses. And that fixes uniquely the optimal solution to be as shown here. And then you do your vector calculus to get some formulas for that. I won't show you these, but that is sort of in a nutshell what you and Oak have done in their paper. They did this as a purely geometric exercise, unfortunately not um, dwelling on uh, the interpretation so much of what they got. And, um, if you look at it, it's, it's, it's a rather off-putting result at first, but if you think about it, it is very neat and it can be interpreted. So let's look at the case where A and B are orthogonal, maximally incompatible. Then it turns out the optimizing, optimizing constellation is one where C is in the direction of A, D is in the direction of B. And then the distances, well, here, two times the distance, the A, becomes 1 minus the length of C, and likewise here for D, 1 minus the length of D. The compatibility constraint is C squared plus D squared is 1. As I said, when C and D are orthogonal, that is what comes of that. Or the sums of the squared unsharpness values is 1. And then... As you see, if you take 2d minus 1, square that, you get c squared. 2d minus, uh, 2db minus 1, be squared becomes d squared, and the sum of that is 1. So we get this circular relation here. You find the circle in dA and db, and I sketched it here. Well, for 2a, uh, 2dA and 2db, it looks like this. And this is the allowed region of error pairs outside there. So there is our full boundary curve in that case where A and B are perpendicular. <coughs> well, I'll skip the proof of that. Uh, from there. Ah, maybe, do I? Yes, I do. Um, you see it's really just running through some calculus and um, the proof here is that the orthogonality is, is really required of C and D if A and B are. I'll not go too much into that here. Um, 
So that's, that's the admissible joint measurement error region, which is 